Welcome, welcome back to the Real with Joseph Lapman. I am Joseph Lapman. Hope you guys are having a great week. Uh, welcome into the Real today. If you're new here, please subscribe for me. That's the best way to support this channel and hit the like button for me. It's free. Yeah, all you gotta do is hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. It's the best way to support this channel. I'd really appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's get into it today, though. Uh, man. Where do I even start with today's show? Uh, I want to be a little more brief today. I don't want to keep you guys too long, but I want to get into some main things that uh, I want to point out today in this show. Things that I think going on with the Cleveland Browns right now that are where I think this is all going to end up with the shot Watson. And also why I think the Browns maybe, no matter who we have at quarterback, can that quarterback actually succeed in Cleveland? I'm going to get into that down the road here. But um, let's start off with the main news, right? Well, first... Obviously, we know the Browns got waxed Sunday at home, home opener. Tom Brady's first game calling. Fox, you know, Fox is calling the game, national primetime game, and the Browns get absolutely just ran off the field by the Dallas Cowboys, thirty-three to seventeen. Was never really close at all from start to finish, and embarrassing loss. Deshaun Watson looked bad. Kevin Fancy looked bad. The team looked bad. Everything was bad, and looked very unorganized, if not disciplined. Looked very unprepared. And so we had 48 hours to digest that game. I went back and watched it a couple times already. Broke down some of the film, which I'm going to share some here in a little bit. And then all of a sudden yesterday, I'm in the middle of the grocery store. And I looked down at my phone and I see this alert. And it says Deshaun Watson uh, is being sued again for another allegation from a woman from an incident that occurred back in October 2020. And pretty serious allegations, obviously, um, kind of similar to the ones he had uh, tw two, three years ago when all that stuff started back when he was in Houston and then the whole process before he signed here and all that. And so another allegation comes out yesterday. And my initial reaction when I saw the allegation was I was surprised there was another allegation from a woman because there's been rumors out there for the past couple of years or really the past year or two since he signed here that there could be more down the road. You've always heard that, that there was more possibly. And so number one, I don't feel bad for Deshaun Watson because Deshaun Watson put himself in those situations. Now, what, whether the allegations are true or not, that's to be determined in court. That's not, that's not for me to decide. I don't know. I wasn't there. Neither were you, but he put himself in the predicament, right? So that's number one. I don't feel bad for him there. Also, number two, we don't know. But also, number three, um, my second opinion on this, when I, initially when I saw this, was exactly what former Cleveland Browns wide receiver <laughs> Rashard Higgins tweeted out, which was, um, let's see here, Browns trying to get out of that contract, LOL, y'all ain't slick. And that's exactly what I thought when I saw that. I said, it's over. I Deshaun Watson will not be the Browns' long-term starting quarterback. Not a chance. I think it's done. I think the timing of that coming out yesterday, I think that lawsuit's always been there. In my opinion, this is speculation. And and Tony Busby's a hell of a lawyer uh, for what he's done in this case, especially he's done a hell of a job in this case. Um, but the timing of that yesterday, I mean, it's just like, very, it's so in your face. Like, it's it's very obvious now, whether or not the allegation is true or not, like I said, we don't know. They could end up being true, and he could be facing jail time. But whether or not it's true or not, the timing of it coming out, that wasn't just stirred up all of a sudden yesterday. That's been in the works. That's been done probably for a while. And the timing of it, putting it out yesterday, was very key. Now, where did it come from? Now, Mike Florio wrote the article, right, from Pro Football Talk, and Mike Florio shared – uh, what he was talking Now, let me clear. So I heard some people yesterday saying that Mike Florio is just out to get Deshaun Watson and the Browns or that he doesn't like Deshaun. Listen, Mike Florio got that information reported. It. That's exactly what he did. It was given to him and it was given to him how to report it, how to type it in the thing. And in those journalism, when you're given things, it's they not only they give you the information, but they tell you it's a lot of times they tell you how they want to put out uh, the information. And that's exactly what he did. And where this comes into play, where Shard Higgins says, at the end of the article Mike Florio wrote, Mike Florio points out how the Browns, if Deshaun Watson gets suspended from this, how the Browns could void the contract and essentially get off of Deshaun Watson. They can move on from Deshaun Watson, void the contract because he's suspended. It's like a clause in his deal. And so 
that's immediate. When I saw this yesterday, that's immediately what I thought. I said they're done. I said it's over. They don't want the Browns, in my opinion, do not want Deshaun Watson long term anymore. I think, I think they want out. And I think what Hollywood Higgins say, what Hollywood Higgins said here, and Hollywood Higgins has been in the business. He's he's an athlete. He knows what goes on. This has gone on in all sports many, many, many times. Go listen to what Gilbert Arenas said <laughs> about when the Washington Wizards wanted to get rid of him, how they got rid of him. It wasn't for the actual gun incident itself. It was something they found they had on him they could use against him that he did. He did in warm-ups, and that's how they got out of the contract with Gilbert Arenas because they were paying Gilbert Arenas at that time. He was damaged goods. He just had the gun incident, right? He, was, he used to be an all-star, kind of like Deshaun Watson in a way. Used to be a great player at one point in their career, was an all-star, um, kind of a superstar kind of guy in, in some ways, some of the abilities he had, but then it got, in some, got injured, and in Gilbert's case got injured, and then had the gun incident. And when the, before the gun incident happened, he was already damaged goods. He was already injured, and they already paid him $111 million, I think it was. It was like a $100-plus million contract, which at that time in sports was a lot, especially for a guy like that. And then eventually, the gun, like I said, the gun incident happened, and then he had the thing where he went out in the warm-ups and did this and kind of made fun of it, and then that's what they suspended him on, and that's how they got out of the contract. Same thing's going to happen here with Deshaun Watson, I'm telling you. I, I don't see... <laughs> this did not come out of thin air. The timing of this yesterday, Deshaun Watson's days in Cleveland, in my opinion, are going to be over. I think he will get suspended for this. The league's already suspended before for allegations. A similar... And I think they're going to suspend him on this. It just came out a little bit ago um, when I was out today. I think I still have the alert. You guys may have already seen it. Um, NFL from ESPN. NFL reviewing lawsuit filed Monday accusing Deshaun Watson of sexual assault and battery. Has not placed QB on exempt list yet. Um, has not, or didn't say yet. Have not placed him on the exempt list. And so they're reviewing it right now. I think he will get put on the exempt list. I think he will get suspended. I could be wrong in that. Um, he knows. He, he may prove this all to be a fraud. I don't know. I and mean, that's a whole other thing. But I think he will get suspended. They've already done it once. And I think when he does get suspended, I think the Browns will avoid the contract. And so that's my first reason. And I agree with Hollywood Higgins here. I, I think Hollywood Higgins hit the, hit the nail right on the head. Um, they, they had this all along. This is the get-out card, in my opinion. Now, why do I think they want to get out, though? That's a whole other thing. And so I'm going to get into that now. My second point of why I think it's over for Deshaun Watson and Cleveland, why I don't think they can no longer coexist. And there's a lot I'm going to get into here. It kind of It's a lot of different directions. I think there's a lot to unpack. But in my opinion, why I think they want to get rid of him is because I don't think Deshaun Watson and Kevin Stefanski can coexist. And I don't think it's a personal thing. I think they personally, it seemed like they, from a public appearance stand, uh, standpoint, it looks like they like each other. They're friends. You know, they, you know, he was on his podcast. Uh, Kevin was on, on Watson's podcast and so forth. I just don't think Deshaun Watson's style, what he'll actually work in, works with Kevin's fancy system. Now, again, we were told there was a new system, right? There was this new system and all this. But when you watch that game Sunday, I saw nothing new. I saw the same stuff I saw Kevin running for the last four years. Right? The same stuff I saw running, him running for the last four years. I think Kevin Stefanski wanted to, in the organization rather, this offseason, I think Kevin was up for a contract extension. Right? I think Jimmy Haslam and the ownership group wanted to get somebody in here to fit kind of, I think they wanted to kind of tweak the offense more to fit Deshaun. Uh, I think now people could say, why wouldn't Kevin want to do that? But I question ownership in this because you remember two years ago, uh, I remember this today, I pulled this back up. This was after Deshaun's first season. Remember he was suspended for all those games. He played like five, six games at the end of the year. This was, um, let's see if I get it to share. Okay, there we go. Remember this was after, this was December of 2022. So this was after Deshaun's first year. This was from Jonathan Jones from CBS wrote this article it said there could be well coaching staff changes this offseason for the for the Browns. Excuse me. There could be well coaching staff changes this offseason for the Browns. And there could be some tweaks on the offensive philosophy as well. Team owner Jimmy Haslam is a University of Tennessee alumnus who closely watched the air raid offense the volunteers have installed to great success in the SEC. So you see that right there, right? 
Now that when they went in the, the next season, the following season, 2023, there wasn't really many offensive tweaks. What what Jimmy Haslam, according to this article by Jonathan Jones, what Jimmy Haslam wanted did not come to fruition in 2023. I think they let Kevin Stefanski have one more year in that system with Deshaun because I think Stefanski probably said, hey, we didn't only had six games in this. I want to run my system the way I want to run it because I'm the head coach and the offensive coordinator. Well, not the court, but the offensive play caller, but I am the head coach. Alex Van Pelt and Kevin Stefanski, if you look at Van Pelt's background offensively and Kevin Stefanski's uh, background offensively, they both come from pretty similar offensive philosophies and stuff. Kevin from Minnesota, um, excuse me, uh, Alex Van Pelt from Green Bay, right? Both come from more of the West Coast, Gary Kubiak kind of style offense, more older, more traditional style those two fit well together. Van Pell and Stefanski were great together because they had great success together. I thought they, what they did with Baker Mayfield his first year, uh, limiting him more, putting him more in his strengths, and running the ball more with Chubb and Hunt, which is why they went to the playoffs that year because of Chubb and Hunt and that run game, that old line, and the defense just had to make plays and they needed to, led by Miles Garrett and Denzel Ward. But, you know, they did well together. And Van Pell was just perfectly fine being an OC and not calling plays. And I think him and Kevin mesh well together. And I thought Van Pelt was actually a good coach. I liked Alex Van Pelt. I thought the, the playoff game he called against the Steelers, when he called the plays that game, he did a hell of a job. But, again, why did they why did they fire Alex Van Pelt? Because I, I, mean, I don't think you ever had a real reason to fire Alex Van Pelt, other than what they said it was, which is we want to implement a new offensive philosophy. Okay, so that's why you bring in Ken Dorsey. Ken Dorsey fits more of what this says here. Like I said, you can see it on the screen there. This was back in December 2022 where Jimmy Haslam wanted more of an air raid offense. It says it right there. And so I think a year later, this past offseason, following another season, I think is when they finally did this, which is why you fired Van Pelt, which is why you brought in Ken Dorsey, right? And we were told Ken Dorsey was going to influence this offense and that there was going to be this new tweak on this offense, all centered around Deshaun's skill set, helping Deshaun get back to what he needs to do. And then we get to the game on Sunday, and it was an absolute joke. Number one, they didn't establish the run game. And number two, there was it was the same offense. Like I said, it was the same offense, the same concepts. And at the, what the crazy part about all of it was at the end of the game, when shit was going south and they were already down 20 and the game was over and it was getting real ugly, they started going more under center and reverting back to <laughs> – started reverting back to play action pass, running the ball downhill from the, from under center. The same stuff we saw Stefanski's offense for the first four years. He's been there the four years he's been here, excuse me. We didn't really see anything new. And it just makes me wonder who was really calling the shots in Berea. Obviously, people are thinking right now, well, obviously the owner's the owner, right? But you know, listen, Jimmy Haslam spends a lot of money. Jimmy Haslam's done some good things in Cleveland, but Jimmy Haslam, no disrespect. What do you know about getting a first down? I don't think anything. And the fact that we want to implement a college system in the NFL from a Tennessee Volunteers team that had Hendon Hooker that one year and still didn't make it to the college football playoff that year because they had one good year, your alumni, now that that's what we need to do with Deshaun. A guy that hasn't played football in two years, uh, I think it was 300-something days from the Baltimore game last year to when he took his first snap the other day, I think it was like 313 games or something, because he didn't play in the preseason when he should have, and that's a whole other thing. Um, who's really calling the shots? And Deshaun Watson, going back to actually that preseason thing real quick, I did a show on that two weeks ago. Deshaun Watson wanted to play in that preseason game, and they told him no. And I don't think it was just Kevin Stefanski involved in that, because Andrew Barry came out and agreed with it too. It was an organizational decision to tell him no. Because they were afraid of the left tackle situation. They were afraid of him getting hurt. But yet again, you go into the game with the space of the same left tackle situation against the Cowboys you did not address. You did not call. You have a guy, David Bakhtiari, out there. You have other free agents out there that are way better than what you have on the roster right now. And You didn't even give him a call, Andrew Barry. But we want to sit you down because we didn't want you to get hurt. 
And then you throw them out there to the Wolves in game one against the Dallas Cowboys and Micah Parsons, and you don't implement a game plan to attack Micah Parsons and to, to neutralize that pass rush. And you said, I mean, they threw the ball. Look at this stat here. I don't know if you guys saw this from that game on Sunday. They threw the ball compared to any other team in the NFL on Sunday. Look at this stat. I'll put a full screen here. Stay with me here. So this is from Sunday, right? This is the most, this is team uh, passing play percentage in the NFL. The Browns threw the ball 72 times Sunday, more than any other team. Second closest team was the Giants at 69%. The Rams at third at 68%. Cincinnati with Joe Burrow, who looked terrible, at 66%. Green Bay at 63%. They threw the ball 72 times Sunday. Now, again, does that... Throwing the ball 72 times with a guy who hasn't played in two years that you need to help, that Tom Brady even said on the call before the game, you need to help get his rhythm back. Does throwing the ball, putting him in shotgun every play, um, and dropping him back and throwing the ball around the lot like that, is that a good idea to help a guy get his rhythm back that hasn't played and his confidence is clearly shattered? No, it's not. <laughs> they didn't even try to attempt to run the ball. The Dallas Cowboys Sunday did exactly what the Cleveland Browns should have did with Deshaun Watson. And notice what the notice what the Dallas Cowboys did. They just signed their quarterback to a mega deal that day, right? But Dak Prescott, who isn't the best quarterback, but he's in the middle of the road at times tonight's top 10, right? He's good. He gets into the playoffs, right? But notice what they did this offseason. They brought back Ezekiel Elliott, who everybody said was cooked, right? All the Twitter football gurus said was cooked, he gives you no value because he doesn't stuff it. He doesn't stuff your fantasy. Uh, he doesn't uh, fill up the fantasy score anymore for your fantasy team. That means he's not good anymore. Over really just being honest with a lot of people that act like they know football but really don't. But notice they did with Ezekiel Elliott on Sunday. Ezekiel Elliott he only got limited carries, but he knows the offense. He has continuity with the system. He knows Dak Prescott. And Zeke Elliott could still give you a, on the goal line, could give you touchdowns. I mean, he same thing Kareem Hunt did. That's exactly where I'm going with this. Kareem Hunt last year led your team last year um, in touchdowns for running backs. I think he led the team in touchdowns that's, uh, maybe in total. Uh, was great on the goal line last year. Won you a game last year in the goal line. Was in many of those games, like the Baltimore game especially, Kareem Hunt had a lot of big carries in that second half. And Kareem Hunt was like a heartbeat of the team. Kareem Hunt was the guy that would give you an energy bunny. He would be the guy that would galvanize the team together, give them a spark, pull guys together. You know, when you're constructing a team, you need those guys in your locker room. You need those guys to pull everybody together. Are guys that can make plays, get guys up, get energy going. They're intangible, sometimes outweigh maybe where they are later in their career, but they're still valuable. They, they and they, a touchdown is a touchdown. But notice what they did with Ezekiel Elliott on Sunday. They ran Ezekiel Elliott at Miles Garrett many times. Ran right at him. And you know what that did? Running the ball at Miles Garrett and establishing a run game and imposing a will got the Browns off balance and the run set up the pass. And that's why Dak Prescott was able to sit back there and just sling the ball around the lot because they established a run. They had a game plan to go against the Browns defense and Miles Garrett to attack him, to neutralize him to keep the Browns' defense off balance. We did the exact opposite. We just went out there and said, hey, we'll just go drop back, throw the ball, and maybe whatever the analytics say. Because this organization has made it very well known, their analytical, their buy-in to full-blown analytics. And I'm not anti-analytics at all. Analytics is a tool. But analytics cannot be your philosophy and how you attack a team, and your it cannot be your overall um, foundation of your fr NFL football franchise, any fo any football team, any level. It can't. It's a, it, it, you're you're negating common sense football from the game, from your game plan, from your organization, because you want guys, because you have guys that are trying to get in your organization that want to get involved in the game because they can crunch numbers together and talk about probability. And, you know, percentage of this play working. And it's a joke. And the Browns, I mean, it's been proven. I even I went on Google today. 
if you go on Google and type in who is the most analytical team in the league and the team that was surveyed, it comes up right here. It's the Cleveland Browns. If they're the most analytical driven team in the league, right here. Who you what channel whole team uses the most analytics? The Browns. And if you click on the survey, it shows you the top five teams in the league, right? Analytically. You know who you don't see in there? The Kansas City Chiefs. You know who else you don't see in there? The San Francisco 49ers. Teams like that, right? Teams that use analytics as a tool, but teams that have a foundation, they develop the right way. They put their quarterbacks in the right situations to be successful. They run the ball. They have a great defense. They play football the right way. They have their style of ball, and they stick to it, and they impose their will on the on the opponents. Chiefs do it every game. You watch the 49ers last night. When Jordan Mason, I mean, Chris McCaffrey didn't play, but some guy named Jordan Mason goes out there. I'd never heard of. Guy runs for almost 100-something yards. They impose their will on the Jets' defense, who has some dudes. You don't see them in the top five, but the Browns are in the top five. And Jimmy Housen wants this air raid offense. And so let's bring in Ken Dorsey, Kevin. We'll make, you need to bring in a guy like Ken Dorsey. Because when I look at that hire now, Ken Dorsey to me was just hired because it was to appease Jimmy Haslam in that report. No other way around it. Because what Kevin Stefanski was doing was proven to be good with guys like Joe Flacco. Right there's a reason why Joe Flacco and, J- and Jacoby Brissett look better than anybody else in the fancy system, and a lot of that's because guys like Deshaun Watson, guys like Baker Mayfield, they can't go under center consistently. They can't go under center, dog. They just can't. They can't go under center because when they go under center and they drop back, they have to t- when they come out and they hike the ball, hike, and they come out from under center and grab the ball. When you come from under center more, you have to turn your back. As you're going back, either to hand the ball off, to fake handoff, play action, or to just drop back. You have to turn your back, and when you turn your back, when you turn back to face forward towards defense, neither Deshaun Watson and Baker Mayfield struggles with this still. He's got a little better at it, but he struggled with it here. They cannot locate coverage. Deshaun Watson cannot go under center, drop back, turn his back from the defense, and turn back and locate the coverage. He can't do it. That's just not one of his strengths. Which is why when you watch Baker Mayfield in Tampa Bay, why he's played so well is because he has, number one, he has an organization that allows the head coach to do his thing, Todd Bowles, but also an organization that's smart, an organization that doesn't have a lot of dysfunction, an organization that has too many cooks in the kitchen. You know, there's a reason why Tom Brady left New England and chose Tampa Bay, because it's ran properly. It's why they had success, right? It's because they brought in Baker Mayfield. And allowed Baker Mayfield to flourish. They they put Baker in situations that fit his strengths. That's why when you watch the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with, with under Baker Mayfield at the, at the helm at quarterback, a lot of times he's more in the gun. He's in pistol because that's what his strength is. He's able to see the defense all the time, and they simplify the offense for him. And he was able to get his confidence back, to get his rhythm, and now he's able to flourish more. And you see what he did Sunday. And Sunday, Baker Mayfield Sunday only threw the ball 30 times in that game against Washington. He threw the ball 30 times, which is about that's only that's all he needs to throw is the ball 30 times. He don't need to he don't need to throw the ball more than that. <laughs> if Baker Mayfield throws the ball 30 times a game and completes, you know, 65% of the passes or whatever, so right around there, that's good enough. That's all you need. You have Mike Evans, a great receiver that's always going to get open, that helps the quarterback out a lot. Which the Browns do have not had. They don't have. They never had a Mike Evans. Um, haven't had that. We we need one. We just haven't had it. So, but that certainly helps. But he threw only threw the ball thirty times, and you saw how easily they won that game against. I guess a lesser opponent in Washington, but still, Tampa Bay plays their style of ball. They know what works and what doesn't work. Todd Bowles knows what's what's going to fit Baker and what won't fit Baker, and that's why they played a straight. Now, one of Baker's deficiencies. You know, when you play that way, where it hinders you is when you get in the playoffs. That's why you only pay a guy like Baker Mayfield a hundred million dollars, which is still a lot of money. But in today's market, is kind of like a mid, you know, kind of like a mid-level player, which is kind of what Baker is, a little better. But because at the end of the game, Baker Mayfield, <laughs> when you play that style of ball, when a guy can't go under center consistently and make a defense off balance as much. A defense at the end of the game, especially in the playoffs. When you go back and watch when he played the Kansas City Chiefs in 2020, at the end of that game, and even in 2021, at the end of that home opener, 
and against the Lions last year in that divisional round game, at the end of that game, what they start doing is they'll start sending five, six guys, sometimes even seven, and just heavy blitz him and make him flush out of the pocket, panic, and have to throw the ball. He still hasn't proven he can throw the ball under pressure consistently yet. Now, he maybe he'll do it this year. Maybe he'll get him over the hump finally this year. He'll get over the hump finally in the divisional round. But there's a reason why Baker Mayfield threw 4,000 yards last year is because he's in a great system and a great culture, structure, right, organization, and they're they're organized. The Browns are not that. The Browns have too many cooks in the kitchen right now. And I don't, as bad as Deshaun Watson looked, I don't know, you know, if you took Baker Mayfield right now and put him in Cleveland right now, he'd be worse. If you put any quarterback in Cleveland right now, they would be worse. Nobody can thrive here right now with the way this setup is. When you have a guy in Ken Dorsey who, you brought in as a whole, totally different offensive philosophy, and he, he's not calling the plays in the offense that he brought in. Kevin's still calling pretty much, he's still calling the plays and still pretty much calling his offense from what we've seen so far, and he wants it done his way. And then you got an ownership upstairs who wants it done their way with Deshaun Watson. And then you got an analytical department, Paul D. Bedesta, who lives in San Diego, having influence in the organization. There's way too many cooks in the kitchen, and there's no stability for any. No quarterback, especially a guy like Deshaun Watson, who hasn't played in however long he's played. And he really hasn't played in three years still. I mean, hell, he's only played how many games here before Sunday? I think it was like 12. You know, it's just never, he's, it's just been suspension. Then he comes back, and then it's just off the street. The season's over. And then he comes back again, gets hurt, and then he, he has a good game. He gets hurt again, now he's out for the year. Like, it's just been a never-ending cycle. And I think at some point, you have to pull the plug. Right. I think at some point you have to just say, you know what, this isn't going to work. You have to reset as an organization. And I think the more this drags out too, I don't number one, and I don't I don't think going back to the first point today about the allegations, I don't they're not gonna stop coming. Not only I think the Browns don't want Deshaun Watts, don't I don't think they want anything to do with him anymore. I don't think the NFL wants him around anymore. Right. I think they want it to go away. I think that's why he got the two hundred something million dollar contract. Here's your contract, now get the hell out of here. Again, that's just an assumption. That's just uh, uh, me me speculating, but that's just where I, I see it. Um, I, I don't think I, I just think it can't go on anymore. I think it's done, and I just think philosophically too, where the Browns are right now needs to be addressed. You know, if Kevin Stefanski wants to call his offense and wants to be in charge, he needs to call it the way he wants. He needs to get a quarterback in here like a Joe Flacco. That's going back to the point earlier, Joe Flacco could play under center a lot. Joe Flacco is more of the older traditional quarterback. You don't have a lot of those nowadays. Now, eventually, I think Kevin has to evolve, which he did show. You know, we'll take his word that he he hired Ken Dorsey, although I think that was more the organization influence that broke that down. But Kevin does have to evolve his old or older offense because these newer, younger quarterbacks come in the NFL. They all come from that seven on seven mantra growing up, you know. NFL quarterback play, quarterback play at, at football in general is at an all-time low because they're not being developed properly. Coaching's at an all-time low, which is why the quarterback play is at an all-time low at all levels. I'm going to play a clip from a man, JB, about that in a second. But, you know, I think that's a problem. And I think, too, when you go back to, excuse me, why they're so unorganized, the pre-snap penalties, illegal formations on Sunday, how unprepared they look Sunday, <clears throat> excuse me, is because I think a concern I have with Kevin Stefanski is he's the head coach and he's calling the plays. And it goes back to what I said in my show last year. You know, how can a head coach call plays? Because it's not for everybody. Andy Reid does it, but it took Andy Reid 20 years to, and got a generational quarterback to get it done. You look at the last 20 years, I wrote it down. All the Super Bowl winners, right? Only three guys who have been the play callers and head coach have done it. Andy Reid, Frank Wright, and the Eagles team, and Sean McVay with a team that was $9 million over the cap and went all in on that team that year, gave up all their picks, everything. Basically bought the championship, in a way. And brought in a veteran, older quarterback in Matt Stafford, by the way. But, and Andy Reid had finally got Patrick Mahomes, a generational quarterback, and Frank Wright had one magical run. It's not for, and I reached out to a 
three-time national championship coach in college under Urban Meyer, offensive coach. And I asked him, I said, hey, what's your thoughts on this? You know what he told me? You don't want your play caller to feel emotional, to feel the emotions of the game, right? It's a chess match. Momentum has to be calculated. And so he has to understand the game at a really high level, which Kevin does. Uh, he's an NFL. I think he does that well. I think he knows the game. But <laughs> understand what you're trying to get done. Comes down to personnel. I'm reading some of the notes he gave you from what I asked him. And he also said, find ways to get great players the ball in their hands. Um, is a positive skill set. It's a strength. Get in the ball, you know, putting guys in their strengths, not not forcing guys to play in your system, right, or what the analytics say. And now that your head coach has to be involved, your, your offensive, excuse me, your offensive coordinator has to be heavily involved with the offense, everything he does, all week in the game planning. When you're a head coach, you get pulled in many different directions throughout the week. You're the head coach. And your head coach is all supposed to, he's involved in getting the guys emotionally up and charged. But he, like, like the guy told me, you don't want your play car to feel emotional. He has to play chess. He has to be zoned in. That's why a lot of guys go sit up in the booth because they they're, they're blocked out. They're in a room, and they're watching from upstairs, calling the plays. That's why Ryan Day gave up play calling to Chip Kelly, and you see how Ohio State has looked. It's completely different. Yeah, they brought in new personnel, but if, if Ryan Day was still calling the plays last year and it was the same thing, they wouldn't look as sharp as they looked the first two games. I get, granted, it's lesser opponents, but that offense is flowing. It's because and Ryan Davin looks better. He looks healthier. He's lost weight, right? You know what I mean? Like he he knew what was best. Let's bring in an experienced coordinator, a former head coach, and allow him to call the plays. And look how it's looked. And the Browns have proven that the Browns brought in a former head coach as their defensive coordinator and Jim Schwartz. And look how that defense looked in one year. The offense, we won't do it, though. But why is Kevin Stefanski so hesitant to give up the play calling? And why? And it's why I think they look so unorganized, because they're just – he's he, a head coach gets pulled so many directions throughout the week and game planning and stuff. I think it's affecting how they look on the field. I think you're seeing it play out, right? And so why won't he give it up? And I, I wonder, if is, it, he's, is he afraid to give up power because – he may not have a lot of power. Maybe that's the only power he has is that play call sheet. I, I just want, I don't, we got, as Browns fans, we have to stop BSing ourselves and stop, <laughs> full, and then stop trying to be blind. We need to start asking our, our questioning our ownership and questioning these people. There's something wrong here. Why did Baker Mayfield leave Cleveland all of a sudden look great again and look good? Why, why can't that be, if it could be done in Tampa, why can't it be done in Cleveland? Because Tampa's set up, there's st there's things they do in Tampa that we don't do in Cleveland, and that's the main issue with all of this. But I also think that they could look going back to the main point of today's show: why Deshaun Watson and the Cleveland Browns can no longer coexist. I just think Deshaun mentally, he's just not gonna be able to get back here. Deshaun Watson now. The stuff off the field, I don't think is also why I don't think I don't think Deshaun once he leaves Cleveland, I don't know if I don't think he'll ever play for another team ever again. I think once he gets suspended and the Browns void him, I think if which again that's speculation, but I think that might I think that's what's going to happen. I think he's done. I don't think he's ever going to play again. I think he'll be out of the NFL forever. I think he may just retire and go away. But if he if he don't if he wants to pursue an NFL career and he wants to get back to being a, a, an elite quarterback or even just a, a serviceable starter. It's not going to happen in Cleveland because I just think it's just too much in two years. And I, I just don't think we're set up as a franchise for a guy like Deshaun in, in that circumstance and that situation in particular, which is unique, for him to come back and get and get back to the level we need him to, what you paid him to be. It's not going to happen. And so I think what the Browns need to do is just go ahead Cut ties. He gets suspended. And if he doesn't get suspended at the end of the year, I think there's something at the end of the year where they can still get out of it. And they don't have to pay him the last two years. Just cut ties. It's time to move on. I get it's one game. You can call an overreaction to one game. It's not an overreaction. I broke down to you stuff beyond the field today. Why it's not going to work and why they can't coexist and why it's time to move on and why the Browns need to really look themselves in the mirror as an organization and figure out why the hell can we not get it right. Because I don't think Kevin Stefanski is a bad coach. 
you know, me saying Kevin Fancy shouldn't call plays, it doesn't mean does not mean he's a bad head coach. That's not what I'm referencing to at all. I think Kevin Fancy is actually great as a head coach. I just don't think he can manage being a head coach and a play caller. Because we've seen well, we the the how unorganized they look Sunday is what we saw last year in that playoff game against the Houston Texans. We've seen it many, many times after that. We've seen some great moments as well, right? But in the in the big moments, like the Houston game, and we saw Sunday, we've seen a lot of those as well. Probably more than the good. But the, having a guy like Joe Flacco who can fix the fancy system that he wants to run is why that worked last year. You have to go out and get an older guy, traditional quarterback like Joe Flacco for it to work. But if you want to get one of these younger, newer guys coming out, which he has to adjust eventually, because like I said earlier, these newer quarterbacks, they're different nowadays. I'm going to play that Y here in a second. I'm going to play it right now, actually. This is from Coach JB, the JB Show. Um, and he really breaks down here just why quarterback plays at an all-time low, but also why these quarterbacks in the NFL are just, and, and all around in general football right now, are just at the worst it's ever been. And why I, this goes to my point, why I think, you know, the Browns, if Kevin does want to, he, he's shown by his, what he said, he's shown he wants to evolve as a, his offense. He wants to evolve as a play caller and, and as a coach. He cannot run the same old scheme he's been running because it's becoming too outdated for these newer quarterbacks. And here's, I'll let JB explain it. High school. What? Yeah. Come on, homie. This isn't high school. Listen, you don't even do it in high school no more like that. Like, if we're in an era on one side of the fence that you're all going to say, let's get our bag, let's stay healthy, let's not practice, let's put helmet condoms on, let's not have two a day, let's not tackle in practice, let's not take, let's take Oklahoma Jewel away, and then we're going to play the guy 140 snaps when he has no rigor because you don't do any of those things I just mentioned? Mm. Make it make sense, homie. How do you not practice, not hit, not do these things, and then go out and play 140 snaps? Maybe. It's why we don't play preseason games and how shitty the quarterback looks right now. Because I just named 16 guys that threw under 200 yards to start the NFL season. Tell me when you've ever heard of that ever in your life. Never. Never happened. But what do I know? Quarterback play is an all-time low. But nobody will believe me. I'm a hater, blah, blah, blah. You guys got to start fucking paying attention, man. And if you just don't understand it, just say that and step out of the room. It's okay. I got it. I got this. <laughs> Quarterbacks are fucking atrocious, and it's not their fault because we know they're the most athletic, gifted guys we've ever seen. But it is bad in the quarterback room across football. Smitty, college football quarterbacks, you got a guy that's playing in his eighth year in Cam Rising, who I know personally, can text him right now, love the kid to death. He threw for fucking 90 yards. Mm. This is his eighth year. And now we want to take a guy like him and get him in the NFL – and you expect the NFL product as a whole to be better. When we got 25, 26, and 27-year-olds playing in college, and then we got to throw him in the mix as a rookie in the NFL on a bad franchise, i.e. Bryce Young, Mormon Milf Hunter, all these other guys we want to discuss, and you expect it to be a good fucking product. It's impossible. It's a fallacy for you to believe it. Like, you can't expect an eighth-year college guy who to go into the NFL on a bad team and start as a rookie, and then you can't expect the number one overall pick to miss his last bowl game, not play preseason, and come out and be great on your franchise opener. It don't happen. Everything you said there was 100% correct. You can't expect it to happen. And, and everything he said there, notice what he said there, though. He was about he was making a reference more about you know rookie quarterbacks or guys that haven't played in a while, like Deshaun. Bad bad organizations. That's what the Browns are right now. They're a bad organization, and what they've always have been. And so we'll get rid of Deshaun, which I think they should do. But what are we gonna do from here? Because <laughs> the problem's not gonna fix. Right, we're not going to win a Super Bowl the way we are right now. We're not going to win multiple playoff games the way we're set up right now organizationally. It's not going to happen. We're a bad organization. What are we going to do to fix it? And so, and again, part of the reason why it's a great time to get off with Deshaun 
right now if you wanted to because the, the draft class coming up, number one, you got your first round pick back this year. But number two, it's a great draft class. You got Quinn Ewers, you got Jackson Dart, you got guys like that. There's a pretty good guys in this draft. If it were me, I would get off with Deshaun. I would roll with Jameis Winston the rest of the year, and whatever happens, happens. You got your first round pick this year. I would try to bring back Joe Flacco because Joe Flacco seemed to, he's an older quarterback who can run Stefanski's offense. But I think Joe Flacco has done this before with Joe with Lamar Jackson. The Ravens drafted Lamar Jackson in the first round. Joe Flacco still started that next year. And then he, eventually Lamar came out after Flacco was taken out. But it, it's like JB said if, if we're going to draft a quarterback, because you have that's the way you have to get a franchise quarterback. But you have, I think the best way for us to get it is through the draft. Rookie contract, right? You can spend more money elsewhere. You have to do it the right way, which we have never done. Bring the guy in, bring Flacco back, right? Flacco be a free agent next offseason. Let's say you draft Jackson Dart, who I like a lot. 6'2", 6'3", can make all the throws, can play under center, can play in the gun. Um, is balling right now. Athletic guy, can use his legs as well. I think Jackson Dart is phenomenal for the modern-day football. Especially in the NFL, I think he's I think he's great. I love Quinn Ewers a lot too. I don't know if we'll be able to get him, but I like Quinn Ewers a lot too. Let's say you draft Jackson Dart though, right? Okay, you draft. Let's not throw him out to the Wolves right away. You know, Bears fans are wondering why Caleb Williams didn't look that good in his opener because they just threw him out there. Of course, he looks bad. Like JB said, of course Bryce Young looks bad, and there are bad organizations too. You know what Patrick Mahomes did? He sat for a year. Look how he looked. You know what Lamar Jackson did? He sat initially. Look how he turned out. The good organizations sit their guys and develop them. Don't rush them out there. That's why quarterback plays so bad. So we need if I if it was me, let's say we draft Jackson Dart, which I would love, and we bring back Joe Flacco as the quarterback, as the starter for next year. And then eventually when Jackson Dart is ready, or however the season plays out, let's say maybe Flacco gets him back to playoffs. Great. Then you move on, you put Jackson Dart in there. And identify your offense, you know what I mean? Set him up to succeed. You know what I mean? Have an offense. If you, if, if Kevin Fancy wants to run his old same offense, then just say it and just keep calling plays. I think eventually you need to evolve though, Kevin, and maybe bring in and maybe more a seasoned coordinator and let him call the plays. Maybe Ken Dorsey can be that. I don't know. Ken Dorsey, didn't, it didn't go well for Ken Dorsey in Buffalo. They fired him, got him out of there. The team looked better. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, if it were me, I would try to get more of an ex. And I said this back when they were hiring, trying to find an OC. I would try to find somebody who's an, an ex-coach, uh, kind of like you do with Jim Schwartz, somebody who's more seasoned, and, and let them come in here and be the play caller and the offensive coordinator. And Kevin just be the head coach, which I think he's great at. Managing, right? One thing you saw Kevin's fans do on uh, during that game Sunday, many times actually, was – I never seen him react that way he did when Deshaun threw that ball, got tipped by Micah Parsons, bad play call, bad priest. All of it was bad. He should have just took the sack, really. But he threw the pick. He runs off the field, and I guess he was right there. Kevin's fancy, ripping off his headset, yelling, screaming. Emotional. Your play caller, emotional. I saw Andy Reid last year get pushed in, a, in the Super Bowl by Travis Kelsey. He didn't really flinch. Andy Reid just kind of looked at him like this and just went back to calling plays. No emotion. Just saying. So that's what I would do. I would move off with Deshaun. It's not going to work. It ain't going to go anywhere. I don't think he's going to be in the NFL much longer anyways. So, and I think he will get suspended from this. So, but it's a great draft class. But again, we can draft whoever. We could sign whoever. And it might not need anything. I mean, if I'm a quarterback right now, would I want to come to Cleveland? No. Not in this setup from top to bottom organizationally. We need to fix our organization first. That's first and foremost. And then worry about who we're going to put at quarterback. If we, if, now again, we could put Jameis out there this year and win 10 games. We could do what we did last year, but you saw that only gets you so far. If you want to really win in the playoffs, you have to have a quarterback that can win you many games. For many, If you want to be a great team year in and year out and win in the playoffs, you have to find a franchise quarterback, the real guys you pay $207 million to, that can win you multiple playoff games. Right? Guys that, and preferably that are 6'2 or above, have something about them that's different. There's some guys in this draft that think could be that. 
guys that can win you multiple playoff games. You if you could develop them into that. But we're not a franchise right now that could develop quarterbacks. We're not. And we're just not. And so that's where I will go with this. And the last thing I want to point out today, though, about, about all of this is go back to this, right? Oh, we'll not go back. Well, let me show you this. So this is from the first drive of the game on Sunday. You can see there it's the first quarter. All right, first quarter, 11 minutes, 24 seconds. It's their first drive. They just got the sack. They're plus territory from a great punt return. But they just had a five-yard penalty that set them back. And you can see this play here. So the ball was just hiked on this play. I can't show the actual replay of the play because of copyright reasons. But So I took a picture of it here because I went back and rewatched the game. As you can see here on the screen, where I circled, Amari Cooper is running right there at the bottom of the screen, right? First and 15. And Deshaun Watson hikes the ball and immediately, as soon as he hikes it, look where his eyes are. Completely zoned in. This is literally when the ball is just hiked. You can see the guys are just now running. Look at the receivers. They're just now breaking off the line of scrimmage. The ball was just hiked. His eyes are completely squared right on Amari Cooper. Almost like the ball was designed from the get-go. It was a design play from the jump to go to Amari first. And Deshaun Watson, you can see here, Amari Cooper as the route continues. He's not open. They're in man coverage, one safety over the top. And they're rushing one, two, three, four, five, six guys, right, which is their game plan. They were going to rush. The, that was Dallas's whole game plan. Just put a lot of pressure on Deshaun. You have a weak left tackle. Play man because a lot of our receivers have not shown they can get open consistently man coverage, especially this game. And that was Dallas's whole game plan, and it worked, right? But also, it's almost like he – the ball was had to go to Amari Cooper because look here, he tries to force the ball to Amari Cooper. The ball gets deflected. Now there was a little bit of a PI that didn't get called. Um, but again, it looked like a forced play. And you can see on the next slide, if Deshaun Watson would have just went through his reads, which would have been Amari the first read, and look at where I circled here in the red, the second read, which is Jerry Judy. Jerry Judy's open. His guy sagged off. He's you look here on the go back to the previous slide. Jerry Judy's guys drop back. Jerry Judy's defender, he drops back more. Jerry Judy beats him out the break at the uh, top of the route. He breaks off to the middle. He's open. But Deshaun's trying to force the ball here to Amari. But Jerry Judy, and if you look right here at the next slide, the ball's in the air, about to get deflected by the defender. Look how open Jerry, I'm uh, pointing here on the screen. Look how open Jerry Judy is. That ball should be there. The ball should be where that red circle, where that red circle is right there. The ball should be there. That's a, that's possibly a first down. And there, look at the green in front of him. He catches it at yards after the catch. That might be a first down. But Sean Watson is forcing the ball here to Amari Cooper, and it made me think. I did a show last year in January. That was one of my most viewed shows I've done. Um, had some some one negative response about it from some guy that told me I should shake my head because of what I said on the show that day because I point I reacted to something that Sean Watts said in his podcast. This is January of this year, January 2024. And Deshaun Watson said something on his podcast that I, I thought was really interesting. And I reacted to it. And I thought of it again today when I went back and watched that. Now, remember, what I just showed you was in the first quarter. It was the opening drive, right? It was the opening drive of the game. Scripted plays. Kevin Stacey likes to script his plays like some teams do opening the game. Some teams like Dallas, though, they let Dak make audibles at the line of scrimmage like he did in the red zone. That one touchdown, he identified they were blitzing. He threw the he, he identified it. He audibled. He threw a beautiful pass out to the corner of the end zone for a touchdown to Brandon Cooks, right? But the Browns and Baker Mayfield did that. That play I just showed you is something Baker Mayfield did when he was here as well. He did it all the time. It would hike the ball and he'd immediately go, he would throw the ball right. He, it was like he already knew he was going with the ball before the snap. Very scripted, kind of analytical in a way. But here's what Deshaun Watson said back in January of this year about that. And it made me think of it again here. Here's what Deshaun said back then. Do you? Both of you guys, do y'all think that maybe sometimes not being a game manager held you back because you both have tremendous so, ability to do things outside of schedule 
And like just not playing on a schedule might have hurt you in your career. You go first, I, I I say for me, I think not necessarily in a in a full game, but like the first half of the game. Because you know, Cam, a lot of a lot of time I'm not sure if, if if your OCs did it, but like the first 15 plays, first 20 plays already started. Yeah, you know what that is. So you're trying to play within that. All right, this is where the ball usually go. You go throughout the week, you go throughout the different looks. All right, this here, here, here. I never been a fan of that just because I know the other team's going to adjust quick and I got to adjust because they're not going to play me the same way like the other quarterback. They're not going to play me the same way like Brock Purdy. You feel me? They're not going to play me the same way like a tour because I can use my legs, I can run, I do a lot more movement in the pocket, things like that. So, like, for me, I think, like, the first half, like, I'm trying to figure it out and, like, I start off slow. But once that third and fourth quarter come around, now you just calling your best plays. You trying to make some shit work. And you got to make your playmakers got to make plays, especially in that fourth quarter. Absolutely. That was a, I was, I was me talking for my last show when I did that that day. I pulled it up from it. Um, but you heard what he said there talking about he's not a fan of that, not a fan of the first 15, 10 to 15, 20 plays scripted. And when you go back to Sunday again, here we are the following season. And look where his eyes are pre-snap. This is the first opening drive. This is a scripted play. Obviously, you could tell just the way it was uh, the way it was conducted. And as soon as he hikes the ball, his eyes are right on Amari. Jerry Judy's actually open up top. If he would actually go through the progressions, the ball is forced to Amari, wasted down. We saw a lot of that on Sunday. And. Again, and it's like he said there, he talked about the second half of games a lot of times is when he would, and you go back to last year, the two best games, Arizona and Baltimore, he looked better in the second half. And, you know, the second half of that game versus Baltimore, he was 14 of 14, 134 yards. He threw the ball 20 times in the first half of that game, only threw it 14 times in the second half. And they also ran the ball 15 times that second half against Baltimore in that one game. Balanced, right? Balanced attack, which is exactly what Dallas did to us on Sunday. Balanced, took the pressure off Dak, attacked on and <laughs> attacked Miles Garrett. We didn't do that. We looked very analytical. We looked very uh, lost. We looked like we had no identity, and we looked like a team that was not uh, or a franchise that's not built to help any quarterback succeed right now. So. We'll see what happens. They got Jacksonville this week. Who knows? They may go out and shock the world. They may go out and look completely different. I would be surprised. And I'll come on here in a minute. You know, if they come out and they they prove me wrong this week. But again, I think our problems are much deeper than Deshaun Watson. I think it's time to move on from Deshaun Watson. I explained that. I think it's time to move on. I don't think it's just going to work here in general. And I don't think he's going to be in the NFL much longer, uh, personally. But also, you know, I, I think we need to reset and look at look at ourselves organizationally from top to bottom, um, and fans need to start calling it out as well because this this is ridiculous. This this cannot go on. If Tampa Bay can do what they did with Baker Mayfield, how come we couldn't have done that? There's a reason why, and you guys know. <laughs> if you really know football, you know why. But uh, yeah, that's all I got for you guys today. Like, subscribe, share all that good stuff, and uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. I'm out of here. Yeah.